Well, good morning. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, gosh, my head's kind of spinning with all the, the other good talks. Um, they might be clearing up things I'm going to talk about as I think about it, in fact. But um, I think just to kind of set the stage and move things a little bit from where we were, um, the the research and that's been done and looking at amino acid metabolism, bioavailability, and all these things, I think is amazing. I think it's, it's, it's just amazing work they're doing. Um, I think that the models that are being built from that uh, are great tools. And then we've got great manufacturing to try to make these things work. And then they hand them off to guys like me. And then I take these things and try to apply them and escort them through uh, the vast wastelands of commercial dairy operations and then all the variation associated with that. And it's in this space where I live and I try to show value. And it's in the detection of, did I show a response? Am I able to detect a response in you know, a, an indicator on the farm that, uh, that brings value to my customer? And so um, that variation that seems to exist there is what confronts me on a daily basis. And I'm not sure I'm always certain how to deal with that. And so hopefully, um, put some things on the table here that that maybe bridge the gap between the academic side, the manufacturing side, and then the side we're faced with uh, uh, on a daily basis. So uh, Compass Nutrition, there's four of us. We're independent dairy consultants. Um, uh, we work primarily this green area right here is the region that we work in largely. Uh, spans from Colorado down through Kansas, little bit of Oklahoma, Texas. A little outpost over here, Arizona, Indiana, uh, and then over here in, uh, in a little bit of work in Belize. Um, so just a little bit more about what, what we're looking at and all these comments on variation and feeds and different things like that. I, I get it. Uh, this gives you a feel of what we're doing each month. We're moving about 240,000 tons of ensiled and fresh uh, forages. Uh, we deal with quite a range. I'm sure most of you do too. Corn silage. Uh, sorghum silages, triticales, oats, wheats, um, legumes, you know, alfalfas. So all these forages are flowing through. We're moving about 70,000 tons of commodities, grains added as VTMs each month. And as I went back and, uh, you know, just kind of reviewing things, uh, you know, everything that these other guys have said, I think just rings true. Um, I run about 15.5 to 17.5% crude protein across these forages and feeds that are flowing through the system. And I'm not really paying much attention to this. I'm, I'm mostly looking at metabolizable protein, balancing for some predetermined target milk based on that. And so this, in my world at least, is somewhat incidental. I'm not, I'm not just conscientiously saying, hey, I'm going to go with low crude protein today. Um, largely because the mix of these forages, their qualities, the amount of crude protein that's in them, uh, is going to be what it's going to be. Price, a lot of things are going to drive and determine um, where I wind up on this crude protein number. But it does seem to fit within a range that a lot of the guys talked about. Um, I agree with Dr. Chase. If I did a plot of the, the wide range of outcomes in either milk protein or in milk uh, flow, um, it looked look like a shotgun, scat a shotgun scatter plot, and I would have just a line through it that would have a fairly narrow range of crude protein. So that's not really something I'm looking at, but 15.5 uh, to 17.5 is where that runs, and then the rest is MP. As far as amino acids go, when I'm balancing for amino acids, uh, I'm usually starting from something that looks about like this. As I go back and look at all the non-amino acid balanced diets that's, that we're working with and the flows of ingredients, I mean, these things are flowing through on a monthly basis like a, like a river, so they don't, they don't just sit constant. I see methionine, this is total dietary methionine, not looking at the MP portion of it or the microbial contribution, just looking at uh, where the diet starts. So it seems to be running 15 to 20s on grams per head per day of methionine, lysine 50 to 70s. And then if I'm going to amino acid balance, I seem to wind up uh, somewhere around 30 plus and 85 plus total diet, and you can sort out which of that's MP. When I ask a client to make a jump from here to here, um, I'm asking him to spend quite a, quite a few dollars. 
And this is, this is where the value piece comes in. And am I, am I able to detect that we have arrived, that we're showing value, that we're able to do something? So three basic practical questions that I get asked quite a bit when we have a discussion about amino acid balancing is, will amino acid balancing increase my milk protein? And the next question is, will it make money? I mean, will it improve my bottom line? And of course, that's a function of the value of milk protein and the cost of, of balancing for milk protein. And the last question I'm, I'm asked, and this is usually after we've been doing this a while, is why did this stop working? Where did my responses go? Is this still bringing value? And so I get why guys ask me that. Um, I see this sort of thing more often than I can explain with any one explanation applied, applied across the board. So I'm always left asking, am I dealing with random error or is this something systematic happening around me? This is data for 2013. It's a one year of data. There's three different herds. And you know they all have their own different levels of milk protein. And what I'm always interested in is the, the variation because that's where I live. I live in this variation. How do I get out of it? Each dairy has its own kind of normal variation and you can learn what that is over time. And so we're just moving along. I'm going about my way here and then things begin to happen. And so oftentimes you move into summer, I'm told, well, it's heat stress. Well, heat stress causes cows to drop milk. Oh, yeah, I know, I get that. Um, you go look at enough facilities and go across a range of free stalls, open lots, tunnel barns, cooling, all these things. Um, okay, it may help this a little bit, but still, I wanted to come back and take a look at that piece and say, well, I see this in other, other times too. So I looked at some data that I had that was just in the dead of winter time. Had a dairy uh, moving along, here's their normal error, and something happens, and I make a shift, and now I'm operating down here at some new normal. I thought in this case I had a tank problem or something like that. I didn't, milk protein in the tanks, we, we, we didn't have an issue with tanks. So th this sort of thing is what, I'm not sure how to deal with, so I'm open to any, any kind of suggestions at all, but uh, these unexplained pieces of variation, um, I don't know. If we look at intestinal digestion and all this stuff, yeah, I get that, but there's still something that's still not quite explainable to me. So back to this curve here, the red herd, I balanced for amino acids right in the middle of summertime. The black herd was continually balanced for amino acids for the entire year. And this kind of, I guess, was explainable, made some sense. We're rolling along in our inherent variation. Summer hits, this herd drops off. Well, this herd seems to respond. And in this area of the curve where there's no amino acid balancing in the red herd, now they just probably make more protein. They're, they're doing well, they do okay. And then I think, well, this is kind of nice. They're getting a milk protein response, hopefully from the amino acid balancing. And so this, this gap, maybe it's just a herd difference or whatever. They're both following a very similar pattern though. Um, so that's always kind of interesting to me. And then I think, well, that, that's making sense. So then I come back to my third herd. And the green herd is also continually amino acid balanced. And it's following the way of the red herd, so there's no intervention there's no reformulation here for specifically doing anything to go after protein and it seems to follow the path of the red herd till here and then these sort of things kind of happen they just separate back out and i'm always puzzled by this and and there's different geographies different management somewhat different feedstuffs that are in play on each of these herds, so to think that I just wound up in a place where I've had a change in one of the biological inputs that was very consistent that caused this, I'm not sure it's quite, quite explaining it for me. Um, the herd here in black, well, he's, he's kind of ticked off about now. <laughs> he was rolling along pretty good, falls out of bed, never really recuperates, and uh, the green herd here is doing pretty good, and then he kind of falls out of bed. And I feel I'm, I'm pretty certain if I were asked to formulate rations that could do this, I don't know that I could. I don't know if I could say, hey, I'm going to do diets that keep you all pretty close, 
Then I'm going to make a diet that makes this guy come down. Then over here, I'm going to build diets that make all these separate back out. So it just seems like there's something at play. And it seems it could be a little systematic because of the, just the error and the variation. They all are still running about their normal errors and variation, the wobble around the curve, but they're separating out. So I wanted to kind of start looking at this thing over time and, and see if we get a head around it. So just started to examine some practical source of variation that might affect bulk tank milk protein percent. And I know uh, Dr. Van Ambrick says he hates bulk tank data, but I have no way around it. Milk sampling, as far as on-farm broad categorical sources, milk sampling, the diet itself, and then you know seasonality or air temperature were things that we want to look at and see if they're going to come in and have an effect. I looked at over 16,000 loads of milk. The years were 2013, 14, and 16 to 19. These years created really good opportunities to look at data because in these years, uh, milk protein values were high, so we had a lot of herds that were amino acid balanced. Here, not so much. There was really no amino acid balancing in my world here that I was doing. And several types of dairies over a large geography in Colorado, primarily is where this uh, data came from. And uh, we, you know, we have free stalls, open lots, uh, cross vents, um, open lots with shades, cow cooling, no cow cooling, combo facilities. So it's a pretty good cross section of everything that's out there, I think. And then uh, uh, all these were from Holstein cows. I didn't include New Jersey cows in here. And the fundamental thing I want to come back to that I'm trying to ask is can I show value from a technology like amino acid balancing using current methods of modeling and the current state of the art of biology and, of course, uh, the manufacturing. And then in the detection, uh, is, is the system we're using to detect these differences uh, adequate? Disclaimers. <laughs> so I don't claim to understand all I know about these data. There seems to be movements and variations that just occur. Don't know why. I'm open to any explanations that you may have. Um, there's a lot of smarter guys than me that know the biological facts of amino acids, and so I'm not really trying to extrapolate any cause and effect uh, suggestions or, or claims here other than what you, know, you guys probably already know about amino acids. And then any statistical inferences that I'm talking about here, it just pertains to loads of milk. And I think this is kind of important because we're selling milk and the buyer's determining the value of that milk. And I'm not really trying to make an inference about a specific cow or... Uh, that side of the coin. It's just in the loads of milk that we're marketing, that we're shipping, that we're, we're putting out there. So milk sampling, uh, first thing to take a look at. Mm, I'm sure you all are the same. The herds that I'm on, there's three basic components involved in milk sampling. We have some sort of control or information center. Uh, this is just some sort of electronic system that's telling me something about my tanks, the temperature of the milk in them, um, the, the volume of milk that's in them, uh, is the milk cool, these sorts of things. A lot of these can be remote operated. I know they can be turned on a few minutes or 20 minutes or minutes before the, the driver gets there. So they're supposedly going to be mixed and ready to go. Um, this particular herd has two horizontal tanks and a vertical. The vertical tank for sampling has a little pitcock down at the bottom. I'm sure you've seen those. Um, there's always some sort of la ladle involved as well in sampling milk. And this, this ladle, believe it or not, is 50 years old. And it's still in use. It, uh, no, no updates required. I can't help but notice it's hanging on an emergency stop button. But uh, there it is. And there's a longer ladle they have as well. But the short ladle gets used in these tanks if they're, a little, if they're high in milk. And uh, they have a longer ladle that four foot handle on it and what have you. Well, then I've got to have a ladle operator, so there's some sort of sample handler involved in this, this scheme here. And these things are going to interact in some way that seems to be affecting what we're measuring, seems to be affecting the, the milk protein outcome. And so when we get into looking at amino acid balancing or any kind of input over here we're looking at, it has to traverse this system here, some sort of input that gets dumped into the ladle. The ladle then dumps into an IR machine, and our machine kicks something out that says, hey, this worked, or hey, it didn't. And it's this information here that we're you know, going to try to go back to the client and say, hey, we can make money doing this, or we can't. And so I uh, kind of dubbed this my triad of hopes and dreams. And Clay, all your hopes and dreams run into clay in the ladle as well. 
<laughs> because anything we're doing is going to wind up having to pass through here. So we, we want to take a look at some of the sampling variation or some potential sources of it and see if we can get beyond those pieces. So I looked, uh, looked at about 350 loads of milk over 16 weeks, uh, looked at four sources of potential variation. I'll come back to that in a second. Don't get too hung up on this, um, but of the four sources of variation, we looked at a couple different labs, tanks, time, and then driver or milk sampler. And there wasn't a lot of difference in labs. And of course, these samples were taken just in the normal course of daily operations. The drivers were pulling samples, nothing changed. We just had them take an extra one for us. So no real change in lab. Tanks weren't uh, anything to talk about. Time, time is always causing an effect on our milk components, as I'm sure you all know. But the thing that caught my attention was the driver, the samplers themselves. Every time they were part of the analysis, the, the stat analysis, they seemed to, seemed to incorporate a lot of variation there. And so just looking at driver, this is what we found. Over the course of 16 weeks, this particular dairy, we had 29 different drivers. Uh, they had to have a minimum of five loads that were picked up or I excluded them from the analysis. I didn't want just one skewing things too bad. So tank one, two, three, it really didn't matter. No tank difference, but the range of milk protein percent seemed to be highly affected by who was sampling it. For example, this guy here is killing us. Except on tank three, he kind of came around. Um, and you can kind of see what's going on in the variation here. But I want to point out that I'm running a, you know, a little over a tenth of a change in milk protein percentage. And in the world I live in, that's about the range of the response I'm trying to cause when I'm amino acid balancing. And I'm thinking, well, these guys are killing me. They could wipe out any response I get within just their sampling. And it wasn't unique to tank one. They maintained the same error rate through, through all three tanks. This guy, we tried to hire him as a professional sampler, but it, it didn't work. So I got to thinking, well, maybe it's not just the drivers themselves. I mean, it's a tough system. So I went back and I just began looking at calibration curves uh, that have been published and put out there. And this is, this is pretty typical. It's an example I pulled, but this is typical of what I found. This is a chemically measured total protein, or wet chem, against uh, NEAR's uh, predicted values. And from 99 to present, these kind of curves tend to return a standard error of correction or prediction of 0.06 to 0.15 percentage points of milk protein. So this wobble in here, that green line, just to give you an idea of the wobble going up and down, was about a tenth or so, and it's kind of similar to what I found the drivers uh, working with. Well, whichever the source of variation it was, whether it's in the measurement or whether it's in the sampling or whatever, it had a, oh, I'm sorry, I'm right here, it had a huge impact on the value of the milk. And based on which of these drivers we evaluated, we had a spread of about a dollar a hundred weight over the 16 week period. So this driver here, the owner of the dairy called and said, I don't want him anymore. <laughs> but I, I don't know, is it? I mean, he was consistently bad, so I guess that's okay, but the range, and so I'm kind of wondering, well, is this an acceptable amount of wobble? Is it controllable? Is it something I'm in control of? What do I do with this thing? I do know that the economic impact of it is substantial. And over the 16 weeks, as we began to, and this, this was an amino acid balanced dairy at the time, so I'm trying to lever this technology through the ladle, out of the ladle, and then say, whoa, this worked or it didn't work. $200,000 was about the difference between the bottom and the top of the curve right here, in addition to the cost of amino acid balancing. So, you're, you know, like you guys, my clients will sit back and say, well, what do we do with this? Is there any, any real, real hope here? And, of course, I think there probably is. Fortunately, I had an opportunity come up to look at uh, diet data. I had an opportunity to look at herds I had balanced and herds I had not balanced in amino acids prior to seeing the driver data. So it kept me encouraged and I kept pressing on and this opportunity emerged as most do in the form of complaints so in the same week or so I began receiving complaints that hey amino acids are in my diets we're spending money uh, where's my response going they seem to be dropping off 
And so I just did some raw plots. This was 11 herds that I knew we had amino acid balanced. And um, the black dots are somewhat arbitrary. I wanted to break this into period one and period two. Uh, the end of April in 2013 is when a lot of these complaints came in. So I went back several weeks prior to that point. And the red dots are from the end of April, early May to several weeks past. And so just trying to look at the before and after picture of when the complaints came in. So this is, this is give you an idea of what, what that looked like. And to clean up the analysis a little bit, I just ran an interaction plot. So period one are the black dots, period two are the red dots. And I was shocked, they're parallel lines. Well, I thought that's kind of crazy. I can't get one dairy to do anything over time like I need, much less 11 of them that are all moving the same direction approximately the same magnitude at the same time. So I thought, well, what are the odds of that? So I wanted to go and let me go look at some non-amino acid balanced herds. So I went and pulled 11 more herds, um, same setup, just broke the data between uh, pre and post complaint. Sweep the dots away, and it was kind of interesting to me. Um, the dairies up here are all non-amino acid balanced. These are all amino acid balanced. And pretty much right at the same time, there was a break in the data. And so I kind of get why the guys were complaining. They're saying, hey, where is this stuff going? Well, it wasn't just unique to the amino acid herds. It seemed to be across the board. Don't know why. Can't explain it. It's tough. But it created an opportunity for me to at least analyze and compare herds that I had balanced and herds I didn't. And so, hey, it looked like it worked. This was encouraging. So beyond the intestinal digestibility data, the modeling data, the sampling data, we came up and said, hey, look, it looks like we've got a gap here. Um, this gap can vary a little bit. Hovers around a tenth usually difference. It's a little narrow. But what, what was tough is after that adjustment or whatever happened, the the difference between the balanced and non-balanced groups got narrower. And so, of course, the value to the guy spending the money was reduced as well. But nonetheless, it was at least some evidence that the diet was, uh, you know, was something we did in there, made it through the system, and we detected it. I wanted to follow this out through the end of September, so I just created another period four, I call it, or excuse me, the end of August and through early September. So this is just raw data plot showing amino or uh, milk protein from period one, which would have been again that uh, April time frame. Well, every herd through summertime did what we're told they do. They drop in milk protein uh, pretty consistently across the board. And this is just the AA balanced herds, except for this one. This one didn't, didn't drop like the rest. So I wanted to look at that. I balanced that herd in the middle of summer and there, milk protein increased all summer long. So I'm not exactly sure why that herd didn't follow the rules, but it didn't. Heat stress didn't seem to bother them. So just thinking about this part of the analysis, this herd was not balanced here, balanced middle of summer, and then by the fourth period, they had a pretty nice milk protein response. Uh, so all in all, can't explain the interaction here, but the herds that are balanced versus the herds that are not uh, seem to have a measurable dis uh, you know, distance between them. So the whole data set here was about 4,200 loads of milk. Um, period one and two, period one to four, all seem to show some separation between herds that were, were balanced versus herds that were not balanced. So I thought, well, this seems to be working. Pretty excited about this. Um, so all in all, I think I do believe in amino acid balancing. I do think that we're able to put inputs in here, get some sort of output, and uh, say, hey, there's value here that we can detect and we can measure. So then I want to look at the seasonality, because the whole thing here, of course, isn't just taking a snapshot in time, freezing it, and saying, hey, here's, here's value. Time always is an issue, seasonality is always an issue. Um, so how do we set the right expectation for clients when we're gonna talk about amino acid balancing, spend some money, and say, hey, what time of year do we best you know, evaluate things? 
So this graph is minimum daily temperature. Uh, I looked at this from 2016 through oh, most of tw uh, you know, August 2019, really about mid-August or so of 2019. Um, uh, we had like five weather stations we were looking at. Uh, weather stations went down right in here, so we you know, data got a little bit scant. But I don't think there's any surprise. Minimum temperatures go up and down in summer and winter. And I'm sure everybody in this room's probably seen this graph. This is a graph of milk protein, the seasonal movements and changes in milk protein over time, 2016 through 2019. This was a, a, a good opportunity because there was no amino acid balanced herds. So I thought, well, can this be used to do something with it? Help set an expectation. I looked at tw about 12,000 loads of milk and um, the whole range of the data, the extremes, about 2829 up to 34 milk protein, all Holstein data. And I think I kind of keep an eye on the wobble in here. It's still wobbling about in the range that I'm trying to show value in. My detection limits are probably fairly narrow. Then you put these two graphs together. It doesn't take a statistician, I think, to go, huh, they seem to be moving along together. And I loved uh, Dr. St. Pierre's comment about regressing milk protein against dietary inputs or other inputs. There's not great correlations, but there sure seemed to be something going on with, at least in the detection part of the system, in, in minimum temperature. So I regressed them. This is what the regression looked like. This, the regression equation was significant. Uh, there's the equation of the line. It did bend through here. Um, P value significant. Standard uh, deviation, 0.1 percentage point of milk protein, which kind of keeps reoccurring through this whole database. Um, I thought it's kind of interesting that 95% of the observation are two standard deviations were plus or minus 0.2 percentage units of milk. And in the uh, lab analyzing these data, that co-op, that's the allowable rate of error. My milk protein can be plus or minus 0.2, and that's, that's okay. So the thing that caught my attention most, especially after Dr. St. Pierre's comment, was that temperature, this one factor, explained about 54% of the variation in, the, in, in milk protein percentage. W one factor, I thought, well, that's kind of odd. I mean, it's not a great regression fit if you have controlled research, but in just out here in the, the wild expanse of commercial dairies, that's kind of nice to know. I got one thing that maybe explains. But it's kind of scary because it also says that only about 46% is left to be explained by everything else that we're responsible for. Back to the ability to detect a difference in the variation that I've got to live within. Well, here's back to the standard curves. There's the wobble of the standard curve. Well, the wobble in my, my raw data curve was, was pretty similar. So I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe this is as good as it gets. So is there any predictive value here? Can I do anything with this? So here kind of looks like laces on a football. I just begin running some regressions and thinking, okay, well, if I'm moving in temperatures, Fahrenheit, this would be the expected movements in my milk protein percentages. And, you know, you can pick your, pick your temperature you want to move across, but, you know, just as an example. Well, it's no mystery, I think, to anybody that's been doing rations and working for people for a long time, you know that guys that want to sell products that improve components, they usually show up in summer, and as you approach Christmas, hey, look, this worked out pretty good. And that's, I think that's true, but for my purpose, if I want to stack on top of known changes and variation, some sort of response, in this specific database, not suggesting it would apply to everyone, if we're running temperatures moving from 40 to 60, then this is gonna be my normal expectation in this data set of a change in milk protein or vice versa. So it kind of begins to say, well, if I'm gonna amino acid balance and ask a guy to spend money and he puts something in here, 
in the winter and we move to summer and he loses, I don't think the technology quit working as much. I just think that's part of the game. So does it change the expectation from amino acid balancing if I'm operating in this environment? Um, is this my new expectation then if I balance or as temperatures change, I can kind of flow across the spectrum and try to get a better handle on um, how to value amino acids. Now, it's not lost on me the risk of using weather models to predict milk protein. It could be pretty risky. So, so look at these gems. Washington Post, 1971. U.S. scientist sees new ice age coming, supposed to occur about 89. The world's greatest newspaper reported an ice age coming very, very soon. And then the New York Times in 61 was reporting scientists agreed the world's going to be getting colder. And so if all the scientists are in agreement, I'm sure it's a truth. And if I was in the business of making milk protein back then, I'd probably think, hey, this is looking like a pretty rosy outcome. But this data or this type of stuff, it's kind of fun to pick at it, but it's just a good reminder to me that says, you know what, all models uh, are wrong, and, uh, but they can be useful. And so as I'm trying to sort out what are, the, what are the implications of determining milk protein? Is there, is there future predictive value in it? And I, I get to that because a lot of our clients are hedging milk. They're looking at futures. We're trying to determine what are the cheese con what's the, the value of cheese into the future. And they're buying options and placing hedges out in the future. Well, that's going to be somewhat dependent upon the amount of protein you're putting out there on the market. And if we're, our predictive ability to determine the amount of protein we're going to put out on the market is wobbly, then it really makes it difficult to know how much hedge to buy and these sorts of things. So I think there are just some implications. I won't get too much in that stuff, but there are just some implications that if I think we can kind of tighten maybe some of these regressions up, it'll help our predictability and how to play in the futures. And so I come back and I look at the nature of the wobble in all these data sets and they hover around that 0.1 to 0.2 percentage units and it goes back to my lens right here and it just makes me a little bit cautious as my lens a little bit blurry and making these things blurry. And, and I get all the research and I get all that stuff that can, that can infuse error in the system and variation, but I'm not, I'm not so sure this piece here couldn't be tuned on a little bit as well. I think that's it. Any comments or questions? You. you bet, you bet. Any questions for Davey? A lot of information there. It's a lot to, a lot to process. Thank you. <laughs>